I discovered a new part of my inheritance this week. I was sitting with the doctor looking at my blood results on Friday at 3 o'clock, and I have inherited a genetic disposition to gout. Isn't that exciting to hear, right? Within 10 to 20 years, I'm going to be having some fun, right? Can't wait for that. Inheritance is an interesting thing because we say the word inheritance and we usually start thinking about monetary issues. And yet, even if you never inherit a dime, you have inherited a lot if we think about our family backgrounds. It's not just the genetics, the predisposition to baldness or cholesterol or di diabetes. It's the other aspects of who we are, the sense of humor, the attitudes, beliefs, the practices, our sense of taste, what do we prefer. And, and, what, and when we start talking about inheritance, it can be a bit of a touchy subject, whether it be the family jewelry or how we act, interact together, how we deal with forgiveness. Because some of what we pass down, some of our inheritance is healthy, and some of it, well, you know that old saying, never speak ill of the dead? I'm not sure we can follow that always, because sometimes what we inherit is not so healthy, is it? Sometimes what we inherit is, is deeply problematic. Anyone who has inherited a temper that's just a bit too quick, or cynicism that's a little bit too acidic, or mistrust of others, or worse, knows what I'm talking about. I, I know in my own family, I have deep respect for both of my grandfathers, because they both got married as young as they legally could, to women who were as young as they legally could be when they got married. Both of my grandfathers married, wife, married women to save them from their families. And when I say save, I mean if, I found, if you told me that what was happening to my grandmothers was happening today in Shelbina, I would be legally required to call Children's Division as a mandated reporter, and I'd have to make hotline calls, right? And, and so I have deep respect for my grandfathers. That's an amazing inheritance. They did something amazing to save someone else. But can I just say that my family background is complicated? Did you hear, did you hear me, right? There are parts of my family that, well, yes, some inheritance is a gift and some is not. We read today of a family in scripture that has similar complicated challenges around their family inheritance. We read of Josiah, is who we're looking at today. King Josiah, who had to look back across his ancestors. His father, uh, Ammon, his uh, grandfather, Manasseh, and his great-grandfather, Hezekiah. We'll start with Hezekiah. Now, Hezekiah was a man of integrity, a man of honor, a man of commitment. And I know he was committed and brave because he destroyed Nehushtan, which I need to explain. So, if you remember back in Exodus, when Moses is leading the people across the wilderness, at one point they have an incident with lots of poisonous snakes. And so what Moses does is he casts a bronze snake on a stick. It is where we get the modern symbol of medicine, the snake on, a, snake on a stick. That's where this comes from. And so he has this snake on a stick and he holds it up. And as people look up to the snake, the uh, snake's leave. And it directs them to look up to pray to God, and I have no clue about the mechanism. I don't know how a snake on a stick saves the people from the poisonous snakes. That's a different sermon. The point being that here we are centuries later, and Hezekiah has the snake on a stick. And instead of it being a tool helping people look up to God, people are looking to the snake and are burning incense to it. It, they've actually named it Nahushtin, and they are worshiping this snake on a stick. And so Hezekiah, seeing people worshiping something instead of worshiping God, he destroys something from Moses. Like, that's gutsy. That's brave, right? To destroy something that Moses had passed down because... It, because it had become a focus of idolatry. Like, I, I pass off to the guy, Hezekiah, a bold man. 
Hezekiah's son and Josiah's grandfather was Manasseh. And Manasseh did what some people do. He looked at his dad and said, I'm not going to be anything like you. And he wasn't. Manasseh led the people away from uh, following God, and he ruled for 55 years, so he had plenty of time to uh, help people forget. His name, Manasseh, is actually a form of the verb to forget, and so he lives up to his name. And, and so he leads the people in forgetting and embracing the fertility gods of the surrounding nations, uh, and with the fertility gods, he brings in the sacred temple prostitutes, which are exactly what you think they are, and uh, that becomes part of the nation. And so Manasseh kind of leads the people far away from God. And then he has a son, Ammon, which would be Josiah's dad. And Ammon becomes king, and he is assassinated after two years. He gets caught in the middle of some palace intrigue between the people who want him to be like his dad and the people who want him to be like his grandpa. Right? And so he doesn't figure out how to negotiate that, and he gets killed in his bed. And so now we get to Josiah. When he becomes king, he is eight. Right? Can you imagine the complexity of the situation? Dude's eight, right? He is five years away from being an adult at age 13 in the Jewish culture. And his dad has just died. His grandpa was one very distinct person and his great-grandpa was very, very different. Right? He has to decide what type of king he will be. And so his great-grandfather's a saint, his grandfather had practiced abominations, his dad is dead, and he has to decide how to handle his inheritance. What he has to do is the same thing that each one of us has to do at some point. We look at what we inherit, and we have to choose, what do you cherish? What do you hold on to? What is the thing that makes your family good and proud and just a wonderful thing? And what does he let go of? What does he forgive as what his ancestors did that was evil, right? That was wrong, that was not helpful. This, this is what we have to do as well, right? We look at our, the people who have come before us, our, our parents, our grandparents, our aunts, uncles, our great-grandparents. We look back across the family, and part of being an adult is saying, this is what part of the family I will cherish. And this is what part of the family that I'm just not. That's not how we're going to do things now, right? This is what Josiah has to do. It's not a given that Josiah would choose one way or the other. If you think about it, he didn't know either his grandpa or his great-grandpa because he's eight. His dad had been killed after two years on the throne. His dad had become king when his grandpa had died. And then his great-grandpa was 55 years earlier than that. So at most, he was like four when his grandfather died. And so he has to choose what he's going to do. And so he sends some people out to start cleaning up the temple. He's got to clean it up either way, no matter what. It's fallen into disrepair. And they bring him what they found. And what they found in the temple was something like this. This is the pulpit Bible from, for this church from 100 years ago. And can you imagine the situation in which... The, everyone here lost your Bibles, and then the pastor shows up and says, I found this. We should read it together. That's what happens with Josiah. He finds his grand, great-grandfather's scroll, his great-grandfather's Bible, which we believe to be the book of Deuteronomy, and he brings it to the people and he says, man, you got to listen to this. This matters. Right? And he brings this to them, and he gathers the people, and they read the whole thing. The whole thing is the book of Deuteronomy, so it's not quite that long. But they read the thing, and then they commit together that we are going to spend our lives trying to follow this. And that's what Josiah does. He teaches Torah, and he leads the people in celebrating Passover. Like Passover is the celebration of what God has done. 
And the last time that we have a record of Passover being celebrated in Scripture, you got to go back to Joshua. Like the kings had not been sort of helping people focus on Passover. It kind of slid to the side. And, and, and Josiah says, no, this is what makes us Jewish. We must follow and retell the story of why we are who we are. Now, he, has, he does a wonderful thing, right? He has chosen a part of his inheritance to cherish, the part that turns him to God, and he has let go of and forgiven the parts that, that are, are problematic and, and but just aren't going to be healthy. He has turned away from the way of his father. And, and it, that's not just essential for us to do with the people that come before us. It is also essential for us to do with the people that come after us. Because some of you have kids, I'm guessing. And some of you might even have a few grandkids. How many people, how many of y'all have great grandkids at this point? Okay, I, there's a few left, yes. Let me tell you a story about a desk. Remember there was a big desk in the church office? Yeah, this is the last piece of it, right here. I showed up and I walked in to see that desk. And I looked at that and I thought, nope. This ain't gonna work. I sat down behind it once, that big old expanse of wood. And I thought, I feel like I am the superintendent. If someone comes to my office, it feels like I'm gonna chew on them because they've done something wrong. Because there was a short chair in front of it, and if you sat down to it, it's gonna be like Andy looming over you. And I said, that ain't gonna work. But I knew it was beloved because I had found this. This is Reverend Keeve. Anyone here remember Reverend Keeve? 1951. This is his charge conference report. You remember, your name might be on this, right? This is the Oliver Keeve, August 24th, 1951 pastor's report that brags about how wonderful that desk is. They built the room around that desk. Like, I, I did the measurements. I read it here, then I checked. There was no way to get that desk out unless you used an electrical equipment, some, sort of, some sort of saw. But I knew that it was inherited. That's part of the inheritance of this church, right? And God help me if I, if I touch it and I wasn't supposed to. And so who do you ask around here if you need to know? I went to Dorothy Harlan. And I went to Dorothy Harlan and I said, Dorothy, tell me about this desk. And she told me, Andy, I feel like I'm at the principal's office. Like, I'm, I can't see over it. She didn't like it. And I figured, you know what? If Dorothy Har Harlan can tell me it's, we can let it go, then we let it go. And I got some guys in here with some, some ordinary saws, and, and I kept one piece to remind me of it. There are things that we inherit and we hold on to. There are things that we pass down and we need to authorize people to let go of, right? I needed Dorothy Holland to look at me and say, Andy, it's okay to let that go. So that we could do what I now do in my office, right? If you come to my office, I'm going to sit and look at you eye to eye and not loom over you. And then we're going to drink some tea. It's important not just to inherit well and to be able to say there are things I'm going to hold on to and things I'm going to let go of. It's also important to say that to those who follow us, to say, I want you to be more Christ-like than me. I hope my children are more Christ-like than I am. And that means they're going to do some things differently than I do. And that's okay. And they need to hear, hear me say that. And, and there are pastors who are going to follow me. Other churches, and, who I've already been followed by their pastors. And I hope that they are far more gracious and wise and patient and Christ-like than I am. And if that means they're going to change something I left behind in Buckland or in Milan, good. Right? If, it's, if it doesn't work, change it. Right? So that you might become more Christ-like. Inheritance goes, it's, all, it's what we are passed down. It's also empowering those who come after us to decide for themselves as well. What is it that makes them more like Jesus and, and what is not? Right? Now, what Josiah understands, what he is told in his lifetime, is that he will live a faithful life but the kingdom will still fall. His great father Manasseh has done his work too well, and the kingdom is going to fall. What Josiah doesn't know is that when the exiles come, so the, the kingdom will fall, the people will go into exile in Babylon, but when they come back, the way they begin the founding of the second kingdom, 
uh, of Judah re reconstituted and they build the temple again, the way they get, to get that started is by doing what Josiah did. They get together as a people and they commit together to make a covenant to follow that same book that Josiah had found. And, and so, yes, Josiah, he can't change the entire kingdom, but, he, but what he can trust is that God will use what he has done for those who follow after him. When we start talking about inheritance, this is the question of it, right? We cherish what brings us closer to God. We forgive what does not. We hold on to that of the saints that have come before us, the way that our parents, our aunts, uncles, grandparents, Sunday school teachers, pastors, all the ways they have shown us the faithfulness and the patience and the grace and the wisdom and the beauty of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then we look at the ways that they have not and we forgive and we let go. It is my prayer that year by year, each of us might find a way forward to hold, by holding on to what is good and what we have in, inherited, and then leave, leave our own legacies of faith, trusting God to use what we have done in the lives of those who follow us. For one day, people will light a candle in your name and remember the impact that you have made on their lives. Amen.